All right, it looks like we have gathered a critical mass and it's probably a good time to get started. Thank you everyone for joining our IGPP virtual seminar today. And today we're having Daniel Blatter as our speaker. Daniel is currently a John Miles postdoc scholar at IGPP. And before coming to IGPP, he received his bachelor from University of Utah and a master in computational mathematics uh, from Stanford. He then came to IGPP uh, working with, um, to work with Kari Key and then moved with Kari to Columbia um, to finish his PhD there. He then came back to IGPP as a postdoc fellow. And here's a fun thing about me and Daniel. Um, we actually came to Stanford at, uh, in the same year um, as graduate students uh, in the Department of Geophysics. And while I, you know, I spent six years at Stanford to get my PhD, Dan has, take, has taken this rather tortuous path and eventually we re reunited here at IGPP. All right, so Dan is um, interested in electromagnetic imaging of the Earth's interior that includes both um, um, the shallow surface and the deep interior of the, of the, of the Earth, like the lithosphere, phenosphere boundary system. And he's also interested in applying novel inversion methods to better understand uh, EM data. And today he's going to tell us um, his, his recent works about uh, Bayesian inversion of EM data. With this, I will give it over to Dan. Thanks, Jenza. I appreciate that. Uh, it's a very generous introduction. Let me see if I can share my screen here. Uh, and then we will try the slideshow in the window. All right. Thanks, Jenza. That was a very uh, generous introduction. Um, as Jenza said, I'm Daniel. I'm a postdoc here at Scripps, though due to the pandemic, I haven't yet moved down to San Diego. I'm hoping to do that this coming year. I'm going to be hosting, um, taking over responsibilities from Elle and Tienza, hosting the, the IGPP seminar series next year. So I'm looking forward to doing that. Um, thanks to Tienza and Elle for their excellent work. Hopefully we don't drop the ball. Uh, Zhanghua and I will be taking that responsibility. So yeah, I'm looking forward to meeting all of you um, and moving down um, sometime next fall. My talk today is about stochastic optimization, how to turn your linearized inversion code into a Bayesian sampler. Um, my colleagues on this research are Matty Morsfeld and Steve Constable here at Scripps and Kerry Key at Columbia University. And I gratefully acknowledge all of their many contributions. I'm simply the one presenting the results today, but it was very much a team effort. Uh, there we go. Um, Dinza covered most of this. I'll go over this slide really quickly. I did my BS in physics at the University of Utah and then took a left turn into foreign policy. I uh, wanted to be a foreign service officer, got a degree in Middle East studies at George Washington University. Um, graduated right during the sequester period when the government wasn't hiring and decided that the foreign service wasn't for me. Came back to science, did a computational math uh, master's at Stanford and then started a PhD in geophysics here at Scripps. Then my advisor, Kerry Key, moved to Columbia. I moved with him and finished my PhD last summer. Um, as Tienzer said, I'm currently the John Miles Postdoctoral Fellow in Theoretical and Computational Geophysics. I'll be here through September of 2022, so I've got a little bit over a year left. It's been great so far. Uh, my research interests are in Bayesian inversion algorithms, and in particular, in applying the Bayesian-derived uncertainties that those algorithms produce to better understanding the role of fluids in the crust and upper mantle. As far as hobbies go, I love the outdoors. I'm from Salt Lake City. I'm currently based there. I go hiking um, as often as I possibly can. And I'm also a passionate union organizer. I was involved in union organizing with the graduate students at Columbia. And I'm currently one of the head stewards for UAW Local 5810, which is the union of postdocs and associate uh, research scientists in the UC system. I'm a big fan of plain language summaries. So um, they really help me to understand papers uh, that are not exactly in my field. It really helps me to sort of branch out. So if those of you who are not um, into Bayesian inversion, here's my plain language summary. If you get nothing else from my talk, I hope you take away these points. The first, uncertainty quantification, which I will refer to as UQ for short, on model parameters that we infer from geophysical field data is crucially important. If we want to say something meaningful about the Earth, it's usually not enough just to get a single inversion model 
We need uncertainty about that model. Current workhorse methods for UQ, mostly Markov chain Monte Carlo, a very successful method that I know and love very well, works very well on small to medium sized problems, but they are simply too slow to be of much use on larger problems. And that's a big challenge. And my talk today, final point, is to present a UQ method called stochastic optimization that is fast and scales well to large problems. Because it's based on well understood linearized inversion methods, it's very easy to understand and very easy to use. So I hope to be the bearer of good news today and say that basically UQ on our inverted model parameters for even very large geophysical problems, which is more and more the norm these days, is within reach. All right, so first, I hope to convince you that UQ actually matters. Um, typically, uh, we have geophysical observations that we acquire at great expense from the field and we invert them for physical properties that we can invert for. This is a non-unique and non-linear process, which leaves you wondering how confident you can be in those inverted models. And this is where UQ comes in. So for example, say I have MT apparent resistivity and phase data. This is data that was collected, again, at great expense uh, at the seafloor above the Cocos Plate just offshore of Nicaragua. And it contains a lot of very useful information about the subsurface. They're the data are the red circles, the error bars are the black lines, and the gray lines are the forward responses, the model responses of a whole bunch of different models that all fit the data adequately well. Here's one of them. This is the Occam inversion model. And you can see that the x-axis there is log of electrical resistivity, the parameter that we invert for using MT data. The, on the y-axis, you have depth in kilometers. That upper bit, the upper 40 kilometers or so, is the resistive lithosphere. But below that, between say 45 and 75 kilometers or so, the model becomes abruptly and anomalously conductive, which means that maybe at the base of the lithosphere, we have partial melt, or we have a large concentration of water or CO2 or other volatiles. That's a very interesting thing to know about. It could explain the origin of the lithosphere as the atmosphere boundary. But we can't say much about that unless we have an estimate of how confident we can be in this model. Is the uncertainty huge? Is it moderate? Is it small? So we inverted this using Bayesian inversion methods. And what you're seeing here is the exact same model in black, but now underneath it is the probability density distribution. Um, the warmer colors represent regions of higher probability density and the cooler colors regions of lower probability density. The red lines are the fifth and 95th percentiles of the distribution at each depth. And they give you a sense of how well you can constrain the model parameters, what the uncertainty is. And that bright yellow sort of um, band right where we're looking, wherever we're interested, um, at the base of the lithosphere really is pretty tight. And we can actually say something pretty meaningful about melt fraction and volatile concentration. I won't be talking about that today. That's work I've been doing with other colleagues. Um, I'm gonna be talking just about the algorithms that allow you to produce that uncertainty. And if that doesn't convince you that UQ matters, here are four 2D MT inversion models that fit the data to within the uncertainty equally well. Here, the cooler colors are more resistive regions and the warmer colors are more conductive regions. The point is these models don't really resemble each other and yet they fit the data equally well. So there are a lot of models that can fit your data. And so UQ really is something that we need to be thinking um, really hard about. So if we're gonna do UQ, there are a lot of approaches to estimating uncertainty. And the approach that I think makes the most sense, the conceptual framework that makes the most sense to me is the Bayesian one. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, it relies on Bayes rule which is a very simple relationship. The thing we're interested in is the guy on the left. It's the posterior. It's a distribution of probability density across all your model parameters, conditional on the data you've measured and your prior assumptions about the model. The first term on the right is called the likelihood. Uh, models that have lower data misfit have higher likelihood. And then the last term is perhaps the most important term is the prior. It contains all of our biases and assumptions about the subsurface. So basically the way Bayesian UQ works um, from, a, as a, from a paradigm perspective is that you start with prior assumptions about the model. The model looks like this. And this includes how we choose to parameterize and regularize the model. Those are two very important choices that um, feature in the prior, though often implicitly. And then these assumptions are modified by information from the data. So your prior models are essentially pulled and stretched and changed in order to make them fit the data. But crucially, where the data do not contain complete information about the model, our prior assumptions are going to fill in the gaps. We essentially paint in the blanks with our imagination. And that's crucially important. It's important to, re to realize that we are doing this and to be mindful about the assumptions we're making, because they will 
reflect strongly in the posterior uncertainty we estimate, especially where the data do not contain a whole lot of information. So how do we discover the posterior? We repeatedly draw samples from it. And then once we have a large number of samples, as the number of samples grows, I guess I should say, the statistics of the samples will converge to the statistics of the posterior distribution. And so you, you basically look at the statistics of the samples you have drawn, referred to as the model ensemble. All right, so how does one draw samples from the posterior? You repeat the following many times. First, you generate a candidate model somehow. More on this in a second. Second, you compute its posterior probability, which is its data fit essentially, multiplied by its prior probability. And then third, you perform an accept reject step where you either accept the model or reject it based on how probable it is relative to the current model. This is the most standard accept reject criterion. This is the Metropolis Hastings accept reject criterion. Basically it says that if your candidate model is more probable than the current model, you accept it automatically. If it's less probable, you can still accept it. So at the end of the day, you don't end up with just the most probable model. You end up with a suite of probable models. Now, how does one generate candidate models and this may seem like a rabbit hole we're going now, but this is actually a really, really important slide that I will be sort of bringing up over and over again because it's the key to computational efficiency. How do you generate these candidate models? MCMC generates candidate models by making small random changes to the current model. The ramifications of this are that adjacent models are highly correlated because you're making tiny little steps. In fact, um, the acceptance rate for MCAMC, the ideal acceptance rate is only about 25%, meaning that most of your models are rejected. And in that case, you repeat, the current model gets copied and ends up as the next model as well. So you end up with these extremely highly correlated models. Some of them are exactly identical. And this means that the space of the high probability models is explored very slowly, one region at a time. The analogy I like to use is that MCMC explores the model space the way a Roomba cleans the floor. It doesn't pick up random pieces of dirt. It picks up all the dirt in a vicinity and then it slowly moves around and then bumps into furniture and then changes direction and then bumps into furniture and changes direction. And at the end of the day, you're not really sure if it's cleaned the whole floor. You sort of have to just let it run for a really, really long time and then hope that it's gotten everything. Whereas stochastic optimization generates candidate models by solving a randomly perturbed optimization problem. What this means is that all the sample models have a high posterior probability because they aren't being generated by making random perturbations and then you have to check to see if those random perturbations make the misfit worse or better. They, by design, all the models they generate are high posterior probability. It also means that sample models are independent of one another because you're not generating the next one based on the previous one. And the space of high probability models is explored at random the way a random number generator would. And this means that you converge to, uh, you, you generate a set of samples that has the same statistics as the posterior much faster with far fewer samples. All right, so let's delve in a little bit into stochastic optimization, like how does this work? The key to understanding stochastic optimization is to realize that the canonical objective function, the one we all know and love and are very familiar with as shown below, a combination of data misfit and model regularization has a stochastic interpretation. So say I define a posterior distribution as follows e to the minus f, where f is my objective function. What this means is that my likelihood is then equal to e to the minus the data fit term, and the prior is just e to the minus the model regularization term. Or perhaps the better way to look at it is that whenever I specify model regularization in a gradient descent algorithm, what I'm doing is stating my prior assumptions. I am defining a prior distribution, a prior model distribution. And whenever I define my data error and my data covariance matrix, I am defining the likelihood. So really, whenever we do um, gradient descent linearized inversion, we're doing um, Bayesian inversion, essentially. Only what linearized inversion finds is the model with maximum posterior probability. By finding the minimizer of the objective function, we're finding the maximizer or a maximizer, because you never know if it's a local maximum or a, a global maximum, of the posterior distribution, of, a, of an associated posterior distribution. What we want though, in order to turn canonical linearized inversion into Bayesian inversion, is to have it find models with high posterior probability, not just maximal posterior probability. And we do that in a very simple way. We simply perturb that objective function in two simple ways. First, the data is now a random variable. 
So we're not solving for the same data set every time. And now, instead of regularizing, say, the roughness of the model, we are regularizing the roughness of the difference between the model and a prior model. So that essentially what's going on is you start out with um, a model from your prior assumptions, and then you force the data to sort of pull and change and warp that model in order to make it fit the data. So at the end of the day, it's a balance between your prior assumptions and the information from the data. And D tilde is just normally distributed with mean equal to your data set and covariance given by your data covariance matrix. And M tilde is also normally distributed with mean zero and covariance given by your model covariance matrix, which is defined as soon as you specify your regularization operator. It's one on mu times L transpose L inverse. So here's the algorithm and it's called randomize then optimize. This was introduced by uh, Jonathan Bargely at the University of Montana in 2014. And it's very simple. You first, you just draw a perturbed data set, then you draw a prior, random prior model, and then you solve that stochastic optimization problem I showed you on the previous slide to get model M sub i. And you just repeat this over and over again. This is an embarrassingly parallel algorithm, which means that these iterations of the four that do not have to be done by the same computer. In fact, they don't even have to be done by computers on the same cluster. You can be doing some of these iterations on a supercomputer in China and another set of iterations on a supercomputer in Europe, and then another one here on Triton at UCSD, and then just combine the samples after the fact. It's an extremely simple, straightforward algorithm. Just a couple of housekeeping points. Generating those random data sets, D tilde, is very simple. It's just D plus C sub D times eta, where eta is a vector of random noise uh, with the same size as your data. And then generating that random prior model is slightly more complicated. You have to solve um, that least squares inverse problem, but it's a linear least squares inverse problem. So it's very simple. Um, where eta now is a vector of random noise again, but, but that has the same size as the model. And you can do this in a constrained manner, a constrained least squares solve, such that M tilde is obligated to follow some uh, bounds that you set on the physical properties. Because M tilde has the same physical units as the model does. Um, ohm meters in this case for electrical resistivity. All right, what about that accept reject step? I told you that Bayesian sampling basically means you first generate a candidate model, then you compute its posterior probability, and then you decide whether to accept or reject it. Well, you can add an accept reject step to RTO. It ensures that the RTO samples will be distributed according to the target posterior, the posterior that you are targeting, the one I showed you earlier, as n approaches infinity. However, it makes your samples correlated, the algorithm serial, and the runtime long, which ruins all the computational advantages of doing RTO in the first place. And you're back to all of the drawbacks at MCMC. Neglecting the accept reject step introduces a small bias between the RTO sample distribution, the distribution of the statistics of the samples that you draw from RTO, and the statistics of the target distribution. However, the bias can be shown to be small in practice and the computational advantages of neglecting it are enormous. So what we're essentially suggesting is that we neglect this accept reject step and accept the small bias in favor of the enormous computational advantages that that provides. All right, so how does RTO work? To show you a simple example, a one parameter example, um, RTO perturbs the objective function such that its minimum closely follows the Bayesian posterior. And in the linear case, the case of a linear forward model, the RTO sampling distribution exactly equals the Bayesian posterior. What I'm showing you on the upper right in solid red is the canonical objective function. The dashed lines are the perturbed objective functions, just a few examples of them. If you look at the minima, the locations of the minima of the dashed lines of the perturbed objective functions, they follow a Bayesian distribution. They follow that Bayesian posterior. In this case, a Gaussian distribution because it's a linear forward model. The blue histogram below is the histogram of the locations of the minima of the perturbed objective functions. And the red solid line is the Bayesian posterior we're targeting. And so you can see that they are identical in the linear case. In the nonlinear case, our, um, sorry, our cost functions are no longer parabolas. And there's a slight bias between that blue histogram, the RTO sampling distribution, and the Bayesian posterior in solid red. But I would argue that the difference, that small bias is small relative to the influence of the subjective choices we make of our prior, which has a much larger impact on the posterior 
than this small discrepancy, this small bias between the RTO sampling distribution and the posterior. So I would argue that this is not a huge deal, and I'll endeavor to sort of demonstrate this on a, a real field data set in a second. This is a really important question though. What regularization penalty do you choose? Because it really impacts your prior. Here's our prior again. This basically says that smooth models are more probable and mu features very prominently. It basically says, um, how constrained is the set of models that I will accept? How smooth are the models that I think represent the subsurface? And just to show you that this matters, here we invert um, one uh, DC resistivity field data, courtesy of Steve Constable, for um, 1D models of electrical resistivity for three separate fixed values of the regularization penalty weight. And you can see that the 90% credible interval, the distance between those red lines, shrinks as mu increases. And that makes sense because you're saying, I know with great certainty that the model is very smooth. So the space of models you can sample is relatively small. But we don't want the user to be sort of selecting this parameter because it doesn't even have units. It's very hard to know what even what value you should even choose. So introducing the RTO double punch, which we call the RTO TKO, which hierarchically samples the regularization penalty weight. Basically, you let the data help to choose the appropriate range of values for this property. It means you have a new joint posterior, P of M and mu, conditional on D. Now, it just means that all the terms on the right are now conditional on mu, and there's a P of mu at the end. I won't go into the details of this. There's a fancy uh, change of variables and some other fancy footwork to sort of make this all work. But essentially what we're doing is we are repeatedly sampling the conditionals P of M given mu and D and P of mu given M and D in sequence using RTO both times over and over again. So for constant mu, we solve for M. And then at constant M using the previous M, we solve for mu. And then using that mu, holding it constant, we solve for M and so on and so forth. This is called Gibbs sampling. And here's the algorithm. Here's RTO TKO. This first part is RTO as before, exactly as before. We call this the right jab. And here is the left hook of RTO for mu, where again, we draw another perturbed data set, D tilde, not the same as the previous one, but from the same distribution. And then we draw prior mu, which depends on what you choose for P of mu. And then you solve a stochastic objective function for mu i plus one at fixed m i plus one. Um, for example, if your, if your distribution is uniform, this is the objective function that you minimize, where again, m is fixed. And so what mu essentially does is it acts to stretch or squish the model um, uniformly. This is, we call this RTO TKO, TKO standing for technical knockout because we think of this one, two punch knocks out the problem, but it's not a total knockout. That would be KO. Um, in that case, you wouldn't have any bias between the RTO TKO sampling distribution and the Bayesian posterior that you are targeting. We accept the small bias. And so um, in a nod to that, we call this RTO TKO for a technical knockout. The next part of my talk is going to be about some desirable attributes of RTO TKO. But if anybody has any particular questions about the algorithm, now would be a decent time to ask them before I go to rush on. I know people don't generally like to ask questions in the middle of a talk, but I'm Daniel, totally open to uh, that. when you when you randomly perturb the data, do you take advantage of the data errors? Uh, yes, absolutely. So um, where is there we go? In the bottom left of this screen, um, that's how we perturb the data. You just take your, your current data and then you add random noise based on your data covariance matrix, whatever that matrix happens to be. Does that make sense, Yuri? Yeah, thanks. Sorry, I realize I'm going through these slides a little bit fast. I hope I don't lose people. Actually, then there, is a, there is a factor of a half missing. You oh, take sorry. The square root of, of the covariance to get it right. You're right. That, You're absolutely right. Sorry. Yeah. Just typo there. Confuse people. Yeah. Typo. Daniel. Oh. Mm-hmm. Sorry. Well, great, great presentation so far. So, uh, a quick question: What about the normal distribution? Can you use any other distribution for this distribution that you are testing? Uh, which normal distribution are you referring to? No, no, I'm, I'm thinking that just using another kind of distribution, not, not only a normal distribution, for example, oh, something with a skewness or something like that. Oh, you mean for, for the prior, for instance? Yep, 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, your, your prior, well, that's a really a great question. Your prior is determined by your model regularization term. Um, but yeah, yeah you, you absolutely could. I think it's just sort of standard practice to define it as, as, a, as a Gaussian exponential. But um, yeah, you absolutely could choose a different distribution if you wanted. And you could choose a different model regularization and that would give you a very different prior as well. Okay, thank you. Oh uh, yeah, I have a question. Uh, thanks, Daniel, for talk. I have a question for you. When you use the data to invert the penalty the ratio for the penalty functions, so you talk about you using the data to invert the ratios for the penalty function. But my question is that uh, for the L, you do not show wh whether it is L one or L two norm. How do you choose the the norm for the L for the for the mm -hmm. penalty functions? Great question. That's up to you. This is part of your sort of um, where you get to assume stuff about the subsurface. <laughs> so um, we. In what I'll show what follows, I've always chosen L2 norm, but if you choose the L1 norm, you'll get a very different set of models. And the L1 norm, that choice amounts to a very different set of prior assumptions about the subsurface, which I think is really pretty cool because it means that um, you really do have that flexibility in how you choose to regularize the model. And that, that essentially is equivalent to making very different prior statements about the subsurface. And so as a result, you end up with very different posterior uncertainties. And I'll show you an example of that in just a minute. Okay, thanks. Daniel, um, a quick question. How big, um, like double punch, how big a model space can you tackle now? Um, that's a very good question. I will get to that in the second half of this talk. I'll spend a significant amount of time on that question. So I'll punt it to later if you don't Great. mind. Great, thanks. Wonderful. Thanks for those questions. That was really great. And I'm glad you got a chance to ask them while we were still talking about the algorithm itself. And again, I apologize if I blew through that too quickly. One of the really nice uh, attributes of RTO TKO is that there's actually a very small bias. I mentioned it before between the, uh, the sampling distribution and the target distribution. So here we inverted that DC resistivity data again. And finally, I, I show you that the actual data. This is courtesy, courtesy of Stephen Constable um, from 1984. I think this is collected in the middle of Australia. It's a Schlumberger setup. On the left, you see the posterior estimated from just fixed mu RTO. So we're just estimating the bias in the first step, the RTO step. And in the middle, you have the posterior distribution estimating using random walk metropolis, which is just standard metropolis Hastings MCMC, using the exact same prior, the exact same likelihood, the exact same model um, parameterization, the exact same fixed uh, model grid. And you can, if you stare at the figure really long, you can see some minor differences, but not very many. That black line in the center is the Occam model and it's shared by both. So you can sort of use that to like gauge any differences. And there are a few, but they're very small. So the bias in this case is just is quite negligible, which is very encouraging. And here we show that the bias on the TKO step is also small. So on the left, you have the distribution obtained using the RTO TKO algorithm, hierarchically sampling the regularization penalty weight. And on the right, you have the distribution from where the first step is RTO, and the second step is a random walk metropolis. And again, if you stare really hard, you can find some discrepancies, but not very many between the two. And just for your information, the sampling distribution for mu, the regularization penalty weight is shown on the right. They're not identical, but they're clearly um, pretty darn similar. One other nice feature of this algorithm is that it doesn't depend on the parameter grid that you choose. Provided your parameter grid, I guess I'll say up front first, it relies on a fixed grid, which is a little unfortunate. Um, there are MCMC methods out there that are transdimensional, meaning that the number of uh, parameters and where to place those parameters, uh, sort of the shape of the, of the model parameter grid is inverted for during the inversion. That's a really nice feature. It allows the data to sort of help select the number of parameters that's appropriate. Here we use a fixed grid. However, so long as you have a, a grid that is sufficiently fine to capture all of the model structure that is present in the data, or that the data calls for, further refining that grid doesn't change the uncertainty that you estimate. So it's invariant under grid refinement is the fancy applied math term. And this is the part that gets, that gets me really excited because now we're gonna be talking about the computational advantages of RTO, which are truly staggering relative to MCMC. RTO samples are independent of one another. 
well, MCMC samples are correlated, and that really has strong implications for the computational efficiency, and specifically the runtime. So on the left, you see the estimated autocorrelation length or integrated autocorrelation time. It's essentially the time required for a sampler to forget where it started, or in other words, the distance between independent samples. On the y-axis, you have depth in meters. So that's the, basically you have model parameter on the y-axis and on the x-axis, um, the, the distance between independent samples. The median value for the blue dots, the RTO, TKO dots is taken from, this was computed for the RTO, TKO um, model ensemble after inversion is about 1.3, meaning that for all intents and purposes, um, each sample is independent of the others. Whereas for MCMC, the median value is about 3,500. So you really have to go about 3,500 small MCMC steps to get to a truly independent sample, to a sample that is truly independent of the first one, which means that a lot of that forward computation you're doing is essentially redundant and wasted. On the right, you have the, the divergence between the target posterior and a posterior estimated using uh, a small number of samples. So if you fix um, the divergence, so for a fixed degree of divergence or, or convergence to the target posterior, you need about two uh, orders of magnitude fewer samples, RTO samples than MCMC samples to get the same degree of convergence to the posterior. To show this more graphically, I took 200 consecutive samples from the MCMC model ensemble and the RTO TKO model ensemble, and I plotted them according to color. So the first model in the sequence is red, the last is blue, and yeah, the ones in between fade from red to blue. And what you can see, particularly in that zoomed in panel in the center, is that MCMC models um, are highly correlated. The sampler is just taking small steps through model space. You start sort of at the red and you end up at the blue. For the RTO TKO, samples, there's no coherent um, sort of color transition from red to blue at any depth. And if you squint, you can sort of see the posterior uncertainty just by plotting 200 consecutive models. If I go back a little bit, you can sort of see it, right? And that's not even doing statistics on those 200 models. It's just literally plotting them, whereas you can't do that with 200 consecutive MCMC samples. All right, I've been talking about, you know, inverting 1D problems just to sort of demonstrate the method, but what really matters is applying this to larger problems. So let's invert some 2D empty field data using RTO, TKO. This is the Gemini field data set. Um, the data is there in the center. It's an MT data set. Um, the, again, the model responses are plotted in gray. From Those are the model responses for 50 models from the RTO, TKO ensemble randomly chosen. The top right is the mean of 8,800 RTO TKO models. In the middle, you have the, the Occam model estimate. And in the bottom, you have the mean of a million um, TDGP models. The TDGP code uh, stands for trans-dimensional Gaussian processes. It, it's a very sophisticated, advanced um, MCMC code that tries to be very efficient in a whole bunch of different ways. Uh, it's a code that colleagues and I have worked on and, uh, for a few years now, and we're very proud of. But because it's MCMC, even though we put tons of time into making it very fast and efficient, it's still pretty slow. But you can see that all three of them are basically recovering the same feature, which is a resistive salt body surrounded by conductive sediments. This data was collected offshore um, Louisiana and the Gulf of Mexico, I think. Here are the RTO convergence stats, just to give you a sense of the computational cost of this method. Um, it takes about three minutes per RTO step for, for this particular data set. That's about you know six or seven uh, gradient inversion iterations. The distribution for the regulation penalty weight is shown in the lower left corner in log units. Uh, the prior we chose on mu was extremely wide. So what you're seeing there is the result of the data preferring those values. That's the hierarchical sampling at work. Now let's look at UQ, because that's what all, this is all about. So what you're seeing here is the marginal uncertainty for certain depth slices through the model over a depth range of 1.2 to 1.4 kilometers, two and a half to three and a half kilometers, et cetera. The warmer colors, again, indicate regions of higher probability. The cooler colors, lower probability. Those red lines are the fifth and 95th percentiles. And the white squares are the Occam inversion model uh, estimates over that depth slice. Um, well, you can see here, one thing that's interesting to me is that the distribution here is not Gaussian centered on the Occam inversion model. 
it's so we really are getting nonlinear uncertainty, even though we are using gradient based inversion methods to get us this nonlinear uncertainty. You can see that the uncertainty is more, uh, there's more information in the shallower depth slices than the deeper depth slices. That makes sense because empty data loses information with depth. But let's compare this now to uncertainty obtained using TDGP, this sort of transdimensional MCMC method. So use the exact same depth slices using the exact same forward operator and the exact same resistivity mesh. So just flipping back and forth between these two, you can see there are significant differences between them. Um, the RTO, TKO posterior is um, a little bit tighter. The 90% the 90, 90 credible interval is narrower. The probability density tends to be more concentrated. The TDGP features these sort of uh, horizontal stripes um, and a much wider 90% credible interval. Now this might make you think that one of the two algorithms is wrong, but actually what's going on here is that they just have very different priors. And as a result, they have significantly different posteriors as well. Here are four randomly chosen models from the RTO TKO um, model ensemble. And what you're seeing here is basically this random prior model that we are regularizing against being pulled away from that random prior model by the data. So the data is sort of adding structure to that random prior model until you can fit the data adequately well. And again, there's a lot of different models that look very different from each other that all fit the data adequately well, which I think is telling you that the MT data in this case don't contain that much information about the subsurface. Here are four models from the TDGP model ensemble, which is parameterized using a Gaussian process, which is basically stochastic uh, Krieging or stochastic interpolation. You have essentially a bunch of interpolation nodes and, you, uh, and they have resistivity values and you specify a, um, an interpolation kernel and, a, and an interpolation correlation length scale. And you interpolate between those nodes using those parameters. And so you get these sort of blobby models. But these blobby models, even though they look very different from these sort of rougher models, they all fit the data equally well. So I, I guess the point I'm trying to make here is that we really do paint in using our imagination. We fill in all the gaps in, in the basically left by the data with our imagination, with our prior assumptions. And you know, these models, they all fit the data equally well. So it's hard to say which is correct and which is not. I guess the moral of the story is be very mindful of the, the prior assumptions that you're making, including how you choose to parameterize the model and how you choose to regularize the model. All right, finally, I'm getting to a uh, fan's question. Does RTO TKO scale well to large problems? And the answer is that it does. And this is the most exciting part of the talk, I think. What you're seeing on the right are, I, I chose a random model parameter from the resistivity mesh used for the Gemini field data set. So I just chose a random model parameter. I don't even know which one it is. And then I estimated um, the posterior distribution for that model parameter using both the RTO TKO model ensemble and the TDGP model ensemble. And I used, um, a, a, I used the same number of models to estimate each um, plot. So at the top, there were 25 models used to estimate the posterior, and then one row down, 75 models, one row down, 500 models. But the N ensemble in the upper right corner of each plot and I realize this might be a little confusing, is different because it represents the first N ensemble consecutive samples I had to draw to make that plot. For RTO-TKO, it's the, it's the same number, right? Because I'm accepting every single model. For TDGP, however, the first 300,000 models were thrown away as burn-in because that's what, how long it takes to converge to the high posterior probability regions of model space. And then every 50th model was saved only every 50th model due to memory constraints and due to the fact that you know, adjacent models are highly correlated. So why would you save them anyway? So basically it, it takes a lot more TDGP models to get the same um, estimate, the same number of samples to estimate these, these distributions as for RTO, TKO. And really the upshot is if you start at the top left and you go just look down that left RTO, TKO column those dashed lines, which represent the fifth and 95th percentiles, they don't move much from 25 models to 8,831. Whereas if you look at the right column from top to bottom, the TDGP distribution doesn't start to become stationary until about 500,000 samples have been drawn 
And even at a million samples, has the TDGP ensemble fully converged? It's sort of that Roomba example again. Has the Roomba vacuumed the entire room? It's hard to know for sure. And this is really powerful because if you only need a handful of samples to estimate, say, the 90% credible interval, that's really amazing. I wouldn't trust, you know, the, the upper left distribution there. I wouldn't interpret like, you know, the actual shape of that distribution, but the location of the fifth and 95th percentiles is pretty reliable. So that's one form of, that's one way in which RTOTKO is faster. It's one form of efficiency. The other is in its ability to harness high performance computing to reduce the runtime. And this is the difference between a serial and a parallel algorithm, or in this case, an embarrassingly parallel algorithm. MCMC is a fundamentally serial algorithm, which means that sample J cannot be drawn until sample J minus one has been, because it depends upon sample J minus one, which means it has a very limited ability to harness high performance computing to reduce the runtime. Basically, the only way you can reduce runtime is by reducing the cost of the forward problem, which can't, there isn't a whole lot of leeway to do that because especially for very complex and expensive forward operators, these have usually been optimized already. Whereas RTOTKO, it's an embarrassingly parallel algorithm, which means that sample J can be drawn independently of all the other samples on a separate computer even. This gives you unlimited ability to use high performance computing to reduce the runtime. And I'll show you some examples in the next few slides. Reducing the runtime basically just requires simultaneous access to more cores. This doesn't increase the total cost in flops, I emphasize, it only reduces the runtime. So to make this more concrete, let's talk about that Gemini data set. This 2D modeling, the forward um, operator took about 0.85 seconds to run. So TDGP could draw a sample every 0.85 seconds. At a million samples, that's 10 days of compute time. And by the way, 0.85 seconds is really fast for 2D MT modeling. But still, it took 10 days of compute time, which isn't horrible, but it's not fast either. RTOTKO, on the other hand, took three and a quarter minutes per sample. So you'd think, wow, the TDGP is way faster. But it only needed to draw 8,800 samples. So for one sampler working by itself in serial, that would take 20 days of compute time. If I have 10 samplers, I only need 88 or 883 samples per sampler, which means I now only have to wait two days to get UQ. And if I had 100 samplers at my disposal, it would only take five hours. The, when I actually inverted this data set, I had 10 samplers. So it only took two days instead of 10 for TDGP. But if I had access to 100 samplers, it would only take five hours. A sampler in this case means basically one compute node. So I, I did this on the Habanero cluster at Columbia. One compute node there has 24 cores. So 10 samplers means 240 cores operating at the same time. Uh, for our total flops comparison, I actually did. I calculated out every last flop. It was four times fewer flops for the RTO TKO inversion than for TDGP. This slide I think is really cool. It's again estimating the, the marginal posterior uncertainty for that 1.2 to 1.4 kilometer depth slice I showed you earlier. So the most interesting one that has the most uh, interesting structure using different numbers of RTO models. So the first 50, the first 250, the first 1250, the first 6,000. And as you go from 50 to 6,000, the distribution gets a lot smoother, which is great because it tells you that you're converging. But what's really interesting to me is that even though those red lines at the, in the upper right plot, or sorry, the upper left plot with just 50 models are pretty ragged, the location and width of that 90% credible interval is pretty well stationary from 50 models all the way to 6,000 which means you really only need about 50 models to get a decent estimate of the 90% credible interval. And this sort of um, corroborates what I showed you earlier with the single parameter example. So with that in mind, let's do a hypothetical inversion of a 3D MT data set, where now it takes say half a minute to do a forward call. And we say we need 2 million samples for the TDGP to converge because there are far more model parameters to sample over. That's 700 days of compute time. That's two years. That's not practical. For RTO TKO, let's say it takes an hour to generate a single sample. And let's say we need 500 samples to get a solid estimate of the 90% credible interval. That's 21 days of compute time. 
which is still a lot, but way less than 700. And then that's what's a single sampler. Let's say we harness 10 samplers now simultaneously. That means you only need to draw 50 samples per sampler. That's only two days of compute time. And say we had 100 samplers at our disposal. Now we can do UQ for 3D MT data in five hours. So this again, this is just sort of back of the envelope calculations. It's a hypothetical situation, but I think that UQ for 3D MT data is within reach. And this means that we really can scale RT or TKO to very large problems. To conclude, and again, I hope this is a, you know, just a very simple accessible conclusion slide. So if none of the previous stuff made sense, I just focus on this one slide. I hope I've convinced you that UQ is a crucial element of analysis of geophysical data. We really do need to do more um, than just get a single inverted model. We need to obtain uncertainty. Second, stochastic optimization turns linearized inversion solvers into Bayesian samplers. And the principle again is randomize, then optimize. And finally, RTO is fast. The samples are independent. The algorithm is embarrassingly parallel and it scales well to large 3D problems. So that's my talk. I'll stop there and be happy to take whatever questions you may have. Great, thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Nice, uh, it's time for questions. Sorry, there's someone knocking at my door. And uh, there we go. So um, I think Xiao Hua Xu has a question. Has a question. Uh, Xiao Hua, do you want to see that yourself? Hey, I don't know whether you can hear me, but- uh, Yeah, I can hear you. Really, uh, really, really nice talk. Uh, so I have two questions. First is that uh, if you let your Roomba move faster, we would clean our room in a more efficient fashion. And the second is, uh, can't you use like several Roombas to clean your room at the same time? They may be starting from different corners. Great questions. Um, the, first, the first one, can you run your Roomba faster? Yes, you can. But that means you have to get the forward problem cheaper. That's the only way to make the Roomba go faster is to do your forward computation in less time. And that is definitely you... doable, but it's hard to do because a lot of people, especially for complex codes, have already optimized it. But, but when you showed the diagram, when you have like, uh, I don't know how much improvement you're making uh, through like a number of samples, it looks like that uh, the, the, the change of that, uh, the model parameters are, are within a, a very small range. I guess I'm asking about the, the how, how big the steps could be. Ah, the size of the MCMC steps. That's tricky. Yes. And there are fundamental limitations there too. It's been shown that for most cases, you, the, optimal, the optimal speed for MCMC sampling is to have an accept reject rate of 25%. So if you are okay. accepting more than 25% of your models, then you're taking too small of steps. If you're accepting fewer than 25% of your models, you're taking too large of steps. So you really can't tweak it better than that. You're gonna be throwing away three quarters of your models anyway, even under optimal conditions. Okay, the second question is more about like whether PDGP is, uh, can you, can you, are you able to parallel that or not? Like, can't you do that? I mean, each of the sampler could be uh, time dependent or state dependent, but can't you start them from different places and run several of them then combine the end? You can. Um, I didn't cover this because I didn't have time, but we, the TDGP inversion involves something called parallel tempering. It's a sort of, it basically runs multiple markup chains in parallel. And some yeah. of them have, view the misfit space in a very tempered way so that all the models sort of fit the data equally well, or it's much more, much easier to find models that fit the data well. You don't include those models in your model ensemble, but what you do is you allow, it allows the, the chains that with the tempered misfit space to sort of explore the model space more robustly, more, more quickly, more aggressively, okay. if you will. And then once they find a, a high probable model, they swap places with a, a chain that is at, you know, um, that sees an untempered misfit space. So basically you can have lots of chains that are essentially going out and exploring and then lots of chains that are sampling. And that does allow you to harness um, high performance computing uh, resources, but it doesn't ultimately change the fact that you have to run the chains for a minimum amount of time to feel confident that you've sampled the model space well. It also doesn't eliminate the burn-in and it doesn't yeah. eliminate the correlation between models in the chain either. So it, it's like, 
it's an improvement for sure. And I would never do MCMC without, uh, without parallel tempering for a large problem. <laughs> but even then, it's, it's sort of still a fundamentally serial algorithm. Thanks. Good questions. Thanks. Uh, I see several hands up. I don't know who is first, but I think I will let uh, Kathy ask the first question. Um, actually, uh, I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of Kathy. Um, oh, hi, Steve. But I may want to say something myself. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe we get two for the price of one. Um, thanks, Dan. Um, so one of the great advantages of the traditional stochastic inversion methods is that you only need a forward code. Um, but my understanding of the RTO method is you actually need the inverse machinery inside your code, such as the computation of the Jacobian matrix. Is that right? That's absolutely correct. You, you need the full linearized inversion machinery. Okay. So um, whilst I completely agree with you, that this is really exciting stuff to be able to scale up to these big problems. It is worth noting that you need a more sophisticated uh, um, forward code. Um, and, and, that, and that in some ways is part of the cost. Yes, you're absolutely right about that. Yeah, you need an inversion solver, um, something Gauss-Newton or levenberg markhardt or whatever, um, whatever method you want to choose, but you need that. And that comes with its own can of worms. I feel like the strength of the algorithm is that we know a lot about those algorithms already because so much work has been done on them since you know the 70s and 80s. And we've been using them for so long that we understand how they work. And there are oh, a lot right. of robust codes out there. Building, building off, the, off the Occam machinery that I know and love. Exactly. So my question is actually related to something that I see in the examples you showed for the MT and also for the Schlumberger inversion, where you show your 95% uh, probable distribution. And one of the things that it seems is that the, um, the map model from those distributions would not correspond at all to the Occam model. And I'm wondering, is that because you have a different prior if it were a linear problem, you would expect those two things to be identical. Um, or is it because of the nonlinearity? Well, uh, by map model, you do you mean the most? You, you don't mean the mode. You're referring to the the maximum a posterior maximum a posterior mod model. Um, you know, I actually haven't even plotted the map. For these, so I can't say how different it would be from Occam, but it probably would be because I think, I think Occam different. selects a different mu than, <laughs> than RTO TKO would select. Yeah, and and the question I guess is, you know, in the Occam model, you explicitly you specify what kind of model you're going to end up with by the um, by the regularization mode, um, and I, I I guess I don't know whether that's the same for your RTO one or not. Um. Because that, of course, would produce a different model. Yeah, I mean, actually, yeah, I, I, I don't really know. That's something to look into. Because it's nonlinear, I don't really know that I can say anything definitively about the map model using RTO TKO. Okay. Sorry to squeeze in, but can I please go next? Because it might be related to Kathy's question, but I might have some language problem here. So, sure, sure. Go in ahead. slide number 29. Um, you compare your model with the ARCA model. So this one. So um, the seismic tomography, when we show ARCA models, th the biggest problem always is that then people say, well, you know, maybe you got the location of your anomaly right, but the amplitude of your anomaly is probably wrong because ARCA, you know, for whatever reasons, you use regularization is probably over there. But when I look at your top, your, your top, and maybe that's what Kathy meant by map view, those amplitudes are actually a little smaller. So is that, is that because, so, and, and that's where my conf confusion came in. Did you already answer that, that you use a different mu in Occam versus the RT, RTO, TKO, or? Great question, Gabby. Those amplitudes are a bit bigger if you use a different, whatever it is, prior or? Yeah, so this is, this is one of the, um, 
you're absolutely right that the Occam models, in, in certain cases at least, for certain types of data, particularly MT data, it's going to be overdamped in the sense that um, MT data is sensitive to conductors, but for resistive bodies, all I can tell you is that it is somewhat resistive. It can't really tell you how resistive it is. You could make the salt body significantly more resistive and it wouldn't change the MT model response by, by very much. So the value you're getting there is sort of the result of the fact that you're using smoothing and so it's, it's a damped um, resistivity. I think the fact that the RTO model is slightly even more damped even than the Occam model has to do with the fact that when we were hierarchically sampling the mu values, uh, the, the distribution tended to be uh, a little bit larger than the Occam mu. So I think that's probably why. And, and again, that's, it's sort of, this is, you're, you're saying these are what the models, these are the models that fit the data and my prior assumptions, where my prior assumption is that the subsurface is composed of very smooth models. If you chose a different um, prior in the sense of say a, like a one norm, a regularization instead of a derivative smoothing, I think you would end up with a very different set of models because you'd have a very different prior. And I think it's, it, so you, you bring up a very good point, but it's very important for us to be mindful of when assessing the posterior of the fact that we are sort of subjectively choosing the posterior in a sense by the prior that we choose. Thanks. Uh, when you on? Oh, great. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Um, great talk. I have a question about how efficiently you can sample the model space. Uh, mm -hmm. To me, the great advantage of this is you can probably sample it more efficiently. So can you comment on that? Yeah. So uh, because you draw samples that are independent, you don't have this problem of like incremental exploring the model space region by region. And you also don't have the problem of um, having to draw samples in serial. So the fact that you can use high performance computing and you draw random samples, I think really enables you to explore the model space very rapidly for, in, in this particular case, again, like the 90% the credible interval for the RTO TKO distribution doesn't really change much from 25 models to 8,800 models. Um, so if all you're interested in is the 90% credible interval or the interquartile range or the standard deviation, for instance, you really don't need to draw that many samples. Um, so maybe I can rephrase it. Um, for example, I'm very interested in extreme models. For example, mm -hmm. I want the maximum rupture error or smallest rupture error. And um, do I still need to go through this whole like 8,000 something exercise to find the extreme model that I'm interested in? Or do you think 25 samples or certain way of, there are clever ways to go for those uh, extreme ones? That's a great question. I haven't thought about that at all until just now. Um, I would hesitate to say anything really confidently about that because if you're looking for extreme models, it might take you a while before you sample one. So I, you know, I wouldn't want That's to try right. just 25 samples and then say, okay, I know what the extreme is, the most extreme model is. So I think you probably would need to draw a lot of samples there. But if what you're targeting is just extreme models, there might be ways to sort of tweak the algorithm to just go for those, as opposed to sampling all of the boring normal ones and then looking for just the extreme ones. But yeah, if you're looking for extreme models, I would say you'd need to draw more samples than fewer. Great, thanks. Uh, the Yu? Hi, Daniel, great talk. I have a question for the scaling ability and also parallel computing time. Yeah, actually, um, yeah, honestly, yeah, the RTO generates all independent samples, but also it has the trade-off that since it solves the uh, statistic optimizing problem, that means that if you so try to so try to invert high, high dimensional nonlinear problems, uh, you need to iterate iterate many many uh, many more times to find the optimizer for each for the high dimensional samples. That's kind of really a trade-off. So my question is that. Have you tried or just computing and to try the general generalized case that for the high dimensional nonlinear problem, the scalability maybe is not good as I tested. The high the iteration for the high dimensional nonlinear problems really takes uh, not linear, not uh, much more linear time than than your than your ex expected. And sim similarly for the um, 
scaling the uh, scale, uh, scaling ability means that for the nonlinear high dimensional problems, maybe you need more uh, linearized um, samples to generate a, 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 a stable probability distribution, right? Yeah, you're almost certainly right. The, the larger and the more complex the model and the more complicated the data, the harder it is going to be to find um, a, an inversion model using linearized gradient descent algorithms. You, you make a very good point. And it's, it, it doesn't necessarily scale linearly. So yeah, this um, the uh, projections I've made may be a little bit rosy. And we haven't inverted 3D data yet. So that's sort of the next step is to see how well does this actually scale. The only thing I can say is that almost for sure, um, MCMC is going to be even more expensive and more time consuming than RTO. I, I can, I, from experience, having used MCMC a lot um, for 2D problems, um, for example, here's, here's just the data for TDGP. If it takes 10 days for TDGP to invert a relatively sparse 2D model, I mean, it's going to take you, it's going to take you months and months to use um, MCMC to invert for a very large problem. So yeah, RTO TKL may struggle actually to be efficient on large problems in practice, especially if they're very large problems, right, like with millions of model parameters. But it's going to be faster than MCMC. I can almost guarantee you that. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, just a quick, a small question: that how do you plan to parallelize the um, the sampler itself? The RTO TK itself, how do you plan to parallelize it? I see e each individual sampler. Well, that sort of depends on the forward um, code you're, the, well, the, the inversion code you're using. So, in all of the examples I've shown you here, at least the 2D example, we use Mari 2D EM, carry keys code. Uh, so, that was sort of the, 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 and that code sort of parallelizes, it has its own way for parallelizing. It, it, it parallelizes over frequency for MT data and frequency and wave number for CSEM data. So it sort of depends on the forward problem, how you choose to parallelize it. But for, you know, for moderate problems like the Gemini data set, 24 cores was enough to sort of max out the parallelizing you can get, the, the, the parallelism over the forward problem. Okay. But then parallelizing between samplers, that's trivial. You can literally just fire them up independent of each other wherever you want on separate clusters even. Okay, thanks. Uh, I think Matty has a question. Oh, great. Uh, yeah, no, not really a question. I just wanted to get back to uh, when you and if you want to find um, extreme models, you might want to add another term to your cost function that kind of make them light up. And then you could use uh, similar techniques, I think, to get into that regime later on. But as is, uh, I think there is no, no yeah. easy way to find those. You would just need to, because the, this algorithm would expl explore tails of the distribution as slow as any other technique. Yeah. So you wouldn't get there fast. And if so I can you say- mean, you, you mean uh, the term, is, you're talking about the penalty function, right? So when I try to invert for it, okay. Yeah. And maybe I can say one thing just because, uh, because Dan said that uh, there's a lots of uh, uh, shiny things underneath the hood which is true, but this is one of the satisfying uh, experiences where you read um, papers on convergence in continuous limits, and they actually are re very relevant because this machinery that then um, put under the rug is really uh, crucial for making this uh, search over the regularization penalty work. So I just want to say, you know, sometimes <laughs> reading papers on continuous limits is actually uh, practically impactful. So I just want to bring up that that little piece to shine a little bit of light on the beauty of the underlying mathematics. <laughs> Thanks, Matty. Yeah, we should uh, we should never take for granted all of the amazing work that applied mathematicians do for us. We're sort of the beneficiaries in geophysics of all of the hard work they've done, you know, doing figuring out how to solve abstract problems, and then it turns out that some of them are very useful to us in actually extracting information from our data. So yeah, thanks, Maddie, for all of the, the, the hard work on making this algorithm work. All right, so if there is no more question, we'll probably wrap up here. I saw Kathy had a hand raised, but then you lower it. Oh, uh, you're muted. Yeah, I think the question I'm asking is um, actually related to Jesus. It's actually, um, what happens when you have a, uh, 
a misfit space for the model where you have multiple minima that are not necessarily uh, linked. And do you have any idea how that would work with this? Because the MT problem is not exactly like that. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, ideally, the fact that you are perturbing the data and, and the regularization each time means that you should be able to randomly end up at all of these local minima and, and sample them. But you know in, that may depend a little bit on how your inversion code works and the details well, there may become non-trivial. Yeah, it seems like the curse of dimensionality might overtake you again. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's any silver bullet to solve that problem for sure. But things like, you know, starting from a random starting model or uh, other sort of tricks might help. But yeah, I don't know that there's, I don't know that there's a magic wand to solve that problem. Right. Okay. Can I just chime in one more time on this, Kathy? Because I, I actually did um, play with this quite a bit before suggesting it for use anywhere. And the, um, uh, and also my, my friends in the, in, in the um, CASPO department asked me about those things because they also think that they have very wiggly cost functions and they're interested in figuring out if that's really the case or not. So many people are worried about this several possibly separated minima. Mm -hmm. And this uh, RTO can find those if you randomize over everything. So you would have to randomize the cost function also randomize the initial point where you start. Because mm -hmm. otherwise, I mean, if there is a big whale that might attract a lot of you know starting points into one well so if you want to find another one you'll have to to start somewhere else and in principle it can do this i agree with you that in practice if you go to a 3d space and there's lots of minima you might need to start from a lot of different points in order to find all of them but that's just a very hard problem so the algorithms naturally will somewhat struggle you know if your probability landscape is very com complicated then there is no silver bullet as then says, but in principle it's possible with this technique. It's not trapped because it's randomized. Mm -hmm. um, it can find everything. But you might need to do a lot more sample. Yeah, because you just increase the difficulty of the problem by several orders of magnitude. So you will have to wait longer too. Great. Thank you, everyone. I, I had to say that this is probably the most animated uh, interaction uh, uh, among all the seminars I have seen in the past year. So thank you a lot for bringing this up, Daniel. And thank you everybody for uh, being part of it. And next week, we are going to have our um, meet department seminar on which they, David Stackman and uh, Helen Freaker will present their research. And I hope that everybody will stay tuned for that. Thanks for the conversation, week. everybody. See you.